So when we think about mapping cities, we might think about buildings or roads or streets or maybe the settlement narrative that led to the, their creation. But today I want to show you a different way to map a city. And that's a map of their its people. This is a map of my hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. And I want to stress that it's not a geographic map of any kind. It's a map showing the communities of people in the city. And each dot represents a person or a Twitter account in this case. Um, and each line represents a follow relationship between them. The people at the opposite ends of the map have the least in common, and each color represents a community. The communities are defined by the number of friends that those groups of people have in common with each other. So for example, I'm a geek, and I'm right about there in the second E in geek, along with the other TEDx people in our community in Baltimore. Um, I'm actually a TEDx organizer there as well. And um, what you can see here is that this group of people, which represents kind of the civic, you know, group in the, in the city that's talking about politics and media and things like that, are not at all connected to the people at the other end of the map, who are mostly younger, mostly African American, mostly talking about um, hip hop and music and things like that. Now, the point that I want to make here isn't that, you know, there aren't folks of other races talking about these things at each part of the map but that, um, in fact, we are a really divided city, and it's this obliqueness, the fact that the map kind of has two separate halves that really divides the city racially. And if you've ever seen, like, the TV show The Wire, it's not all quite like that, but there is some truth to it. The one thing that tends to connect people in the middle here is sports. Let's take a look at some other cities. So this is Rio de Janeiro, and you can see that it's shaped a little bit differently. Um, again, you have kind of a group of people down here that's similar to the group that was in Baltimore, the TEDx people down here, bloggers and writers, and then various people that involved in different sorts of music groups, you know, fan communities and things here. But then up here you have kind of funk, rap, stand-up comedy, drugs, other sorts of things like that that probably indicate more of like the favela community. So you can see kind of how Rio runs in a little bit of a spectrum as well. But there's a lot more mixing in the middle here, which is an interesting thing to note. This is San Francisco, and again, not a geographic map, this is a map of communities. And one of the things that you may know about San Francisco is that with the big influx of venture capital money into the city, there's been this huge kind of group of new geeks that have sort of taken over the city. And, wow, um, so <laughs> uh, you can see that they're kind of like growing at a, as a cancer on the top of the city here, and there's even a group that's so uh, visible as to be identifiable as Twitter employees. And then you have kind of other things like media, politics, news, gamers, foodies, arts, things like that. Uh, the LGBT community is quite present there. And then things like hip hop, which is the opposite of geeks um, up there. And then let's look at a city a little bit closer to here. This is Istanbul. And again, assuming it clicks. Yes, um, you have a similar kind of community to what we saw in Baltimore uh, and um, in Rio. TEDx Istanbul up here. This is kind of the political writer sort of, you know, civic class up here. And then also right next to this is this kind of conservative religious and political tweets group, which is, seems to be putting out some stuff from the ruling party in Turkey right now. And then again in the center here we have sports, mostly football, uh, it being Turkey. But the most interesting group is this group right here, which I've labeled young men, mostly frustrated young men who really, really want girls to like them and they write poetry to prove it. <laughs> um, now, you may wonder how I arrived at that conclusion. Um, it was by studying the data from this group, which is the largest group of people in, in Istanbul and probably in Turkey, and looking at what they're really talking about. And they're talking about the frustrations of being a young man, of not having a job, of wanting to get a girl, of all the things that we all aspire to and, you know, we want to have kind of normal lives. So the really interesting thing about what's going on in Turkey is that you could really make the argument that its future hinges on how this group gets integrated into either, you know, like a really conservative uh, political orientation or a more liberal orientation. Um, and with all the things going on in Turkey right now and in this region as well, I think that that's of supreme importance. Um, other interesting group up here, it looks to be an entire army of Twitter bots, um, trolls that are um, trying to amplify the messages probably of the government that needs to be studied some more. 
um, and then another group of young adults. These seem to be a little bit older than these folks, and it's going to be interesting to see if these folks move down to this lobe and then kind of go up this way, or really what happens to them. And then lastly, the other interesting thing you see in places where the internet is censored is a little island of gay pornography. Um, <laughs> And this tends to emerge uh, in, in several different places. We'll see another example of it. But the point is, is that when these th sorts of things are available on the open internet, you don't see these things emerge as sub-communities within the context of social networks. They just exist on the web, and that's that. But in places like Turkey, the fact that the internet is censored has pushed this into being something that's actually <laughs> available now through Twitter, which I it's not really a thing elsewhere. Again, in Saudi Arabia, you see something kind of similar. And again, with places that have press censorship and various kinds of tensions, you see a lot of movement into Twitter um, from the, the broader community. So things like religious quotes are over here, and then artists, females, more tolerance, liberal thinking down here, a little island of teenage girls, more gay pornography and naked men, um, and then a little island of prayers and advice and what we call marketer poets up here. These are folks that seem to want to sell devotional quotes from the Quran as like a sort of a service. Um, and I think that there's some of that here in Tunisia as well. Um, just a different sort of city with a different kind of morphology is Barcelona. Now, it's kind of a giant fuzzy beach ball and it's kind of like really well-rounded and you can see that the Catalonian independence movement is right here and then various kinds of writers up here. You've got kind of the entrepreneurs and tech crowd here arts and culture, literature, criticism, uh, things like that, and then the mainstream media right in the middle, and then of course FC Barcelona, which is of supreme importance to Barcelonans. Um, so the interesting thing about Barcelona though is that it is really round and symmetric, and that there aren't like these like uh, disaffected groups that are making the, the network more eccentric or lots of different side conversations happening. Everybody seems to kind of be talking to each other. The other interesting thing about Barcelona is that social media usage is quite high, and that may be because of, uh, it looks like in the research that I've done that um, uh, social media usage is inversely correlated with income. So in general, uh, the higher the income, the less social media usage you tend to see. This is St. Louis. You've obviously heard about the things going on uh, in St. Louis with Ferguson and that sort of thing. And again, you have this very eccentric kind of network configuration here, similar to Baltimore, uh, but a little bit different. But again, you see this kind of large scale, you know, like civic conversation happening on one end of the spectrum. And then you have this other group of people that are really disconnected from that. And this group here is primarily African American. And then up here you have a group that's mostly younger, but almost all white. And the way that we know that they're almost all white is we can actually look at all of their profile photos and get a sense of kind of who they are, what they care about, what their cultural style is, that sort of thing. So. The interesting thing to note here is that there's a real gap right here where there isn't any connection between young black people and young white people. And that's hugely important. So it really gives you a sense of how something like what happened in Ferguson came to happen. It's because there aren't connections between divided groups of people. So just to talk a little bit about some of the research that's been done in terms of what constitutes a healthy network. Um, there's a guy named Dr. Sandy Pen Pentland at the MIT Media Lab who has written a book called, um, uh, what is his book called? Um, I forget what his book's called. I don't know how I did that. But anyway, I'll, it'll come to me in a second. But um, it's all about the study of social networks. Um, and it's the basic idea is that he's been able to identify what constitutes healthy patterns and unhealthy patterns in nature. And it doesn't matter whether you're talking about mammals and humans or whether you're talking about honeybees and bacteria. These kind of network patterns exhibit themselves um, all throughout uh, nature. And the things that are unhealthy involve low frequency, low participation, more broadcast than like feedback, um, and little to no network exploration. It's the idea that if you're part of your little network, you're not out exploring other parts of the network. And I know that um, all of you are interested in exploring other parts of the network, that's why you're here today. But what constitutes healthy networks is short and frequent, high participation with acknowledgement, so like if you say something, people say something back, and then continuous exploration, the idea that you actually value exploring other networks. And one of the things that they found um, is that 
brain development is actually affected in children in communities where exploration is not valued, and it actually makes you want to explore less. I suspect that this has its roots in sort of behavioral uh, evolution, things like that, but the idea being that we are evolved to either protect ourselves and sort of like go into our own little network or explore, and it takes a real conscious effort sometimes to want to explore, and we don't always do that. So what we can start to see is that this gets manifested in places like Tunisia, where um, you might recognize some of these communities yourself, but again, you have a very kind of well-rounded, um, what I would call kind of the civic sphere conversation going on here with lots of different participants. Um, news media, sports, arts and culture, TEDx, tech and startups are mostly over here. You guys are right about here. Um, and then you have this little side conversation about ISIS, which is interesting. Um, but I want to point out that it's much smaller than the side conversation that the teenage girls are having about pop music. You know, Justin Bieber and Demi Lovato are doing much better in Tunisia than ISIS. Um, <laughs> and then you have over here a group of gamers who are interested in football. Most of these groups here are younger people that aren't yet really connected into the sphere here. But the interesting thing about what's going to happen in Tunisia is how this conversation evolves over time. Um, you know, how are these groups going to evolve? Are they going to kind of merge into here? Are they going to start their own conversations? Are they going to go over here? That's what's going to be interesting to see. And we really don't know how that's going to evolve, but over time, we ought to be able to get a feel for that. Now, this is just to offer a little bit of comparison. This is Cairo, and this is a work in progress. It's not done. I don't have all the community identification work done. But what I wanted to show here was just that there's a lot more media, social media use in Cairo than there is here, just for what that's worth. Now, you get into things like this, you know, whether you're talking about the revolution here or the Maidan in Ukraine or Gezi Park or Tahrir Square. One of the things that has been the backbone for all of these revolutions is the idea that social media can help them to spread and to get these messages out there. And people have generally treated um, you know, these social media in that context as kind of a black box that somehow or another you would just be able to reach more and more people and you would be able to get your goals achieved and whatnot. And we've seen in various different examples that that's sometimes true, sometimes not true. And part of the reason for that is that people haven't always had really good information about what the networks look like and how they need to create a strategy to activate other parts of the network and to bring more people in. They just kind of get up and say, all right, we're going to have a revolution and I hope it works. You know, y you need better information than that. So that brings us to some other interesting questions, like where can we get this kind of information? This particular example is nonprofits in the city of Baltimore, but the reason I'm showing this is that this data is from LinkedIn, and I collected the data a couple of years ago. But LinkedIn has just shut off their API to make it possible for the public to get this kind of information. And let me make it clear, getting this kind of information out of their API previously was non-trivial, but it was at least possible. Likewise, um, you can get this kind of information out of Facebook. This is some data that I got out of a Facebook group, except that Facebook is in the process of shutting down parts of their API that make that possible. Um, and that brings us to this. This is Turkey's President Erdogan. On February 9th, he sent out his first personalized tweet that he actually wrote himself, and he said that uh, basically people should uh, celebrate No Tobacco Day, World No Tobacco Day, and stop smoking. Well, the only thing was is that World No Tobacco Day was not February 9th, it's May 31st, but let's not get the facts get in the way because apparently that's not an issue in Turkey. Um, but um, the thing that's important um, about the situation in Turkey and with social media is that, as you well know, Turkey you know, shut down Twitter at one point and in order to get reinstated, they had to strike a deal with the Turkish government that allows them to censor whatever particular tweets they find offensive. And that has a, get a real chilling effect on what people are willing to share and also our ability to try to understand what's going on really in a country like Turkey. So I want to leave you with this thought that network data really is the new journalism. And if you think about the function that journalism has performed for us traditionally, it's discovery, it's exploration, it's trying to understand um, you know, how our society is put together and, and revealing to us things that have been previously hidden. If we don't have access to this kind of information, though, 
And if journalism continues to suffer the kind of attrition that, is, that it has been suffering for the last several years, we're going to be left without resources. So we need to start to have the conversation about how we're going to get access to this kind of data going forward in a way that's fair, in a way that's transparent, in a way that's open, and in a way that empowers the public. Because if we don't, we really are not going to be able to determine our own future. So I want to leave you with this idea that a city is more than just you know, streets and maps and roads. It's really the relationships of the people that live there. And maybe the city is just a manifestation of those relationships. And if we have a shot at measuring and managing the relationships between people, maybe we can create the kinds of cities that we'd like to have. Thank you.